Thank you, Diane. I'll cut 15 minutes off my talk. <laughs> Alrighty. I'm Dr. Yvonne Quezon. I'm um, a retired medical doctor, and I formerly was based in Toronto, Canada. And yes, last Saturday, I was elected the new president of IANS International. So. And so uh, Diane didn't know this months ago when she invited me to speak here, but this is now my presidential celebration. So you're all part of it. So thank you for joining in the celebration. And I will do my best to try and serve IANS internationally uh, while I'm the president. But what I wanted to talk to you about today is about um, my personal journey that I have had five, yes, count them five, uh, near-death experiences over the course of my life. Two as a child, and then three in my adult life. And I've also had many um, spiritually transformative experiences. I'm in fact the person who first coined that phrase, spiritually transformative experiences, back in 90, 1994. And I think some of you here might have read my earlier book. How many of you have read my earlier book, Farther Shores? Oh, good. We've got about 10 of you in the audience that have, so you know that I coined that phrase uh, many years ago. Uh, so, let me see if I can work your technology with my left hand. And this is my new book, Touched by the Light, Exploring Spiritually Transformative Experiences. So, uh, pretty well, everything I'm talking about today is in my book, plus much more. If you're interested, we have some copies outside at the book seller table. So how did I, as a medical doctor, first get interested in this field? Well, it started back when I was in medical school. So back in 1976, when I was in medical school, my last year of medical school, I took a meditation course. And I didn't take this course hoping to have some sort of transcendental experience. I took it because it was advertised that it would help you study and that you would get better marks on your exams and you'd be less nervous. Um, so I took this meditation course. And I found I really liked meditation. You know, it was like a duck being led to water. It felt natural, it felt comfortable. I really liked doing it. So I started meditating every day, maybe an hour in the morning, hour in the evening. And it did help me with my studying and I did do extremely well in my exams. But I'm suspecting to me, you know, at that time, meditation is also a very strong stimulus, we now know, to spiritually transformative experiences. So I had my first adult STE while I was in my last year of medical school. So I was meditating this particular uh, day with a group in an auditorium, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than this. And uh, while I was meditating, all of a sudden I heard this loud, inner roaring sound, sort of like the rush of a waterfalls or the roaring of a waterfalls. And I felt this huge um, sort of surge of energy go up my body and spine. And then my consciousness went out of body and I expanded to fill this vast space bigger than the auditorium. And my consciousness transformed into what I would call pure love. And I remember thinking, Wow, no wonder people like to meditate. This is awesome. Because I didn't know any better. I thought that other people were all having this when they meditated, and that I finally got my technique right or something, so I was having like the it experience you're supposed to have when you meditate. And so it lasted for the rest of my meditation, maybe for an hour or something. And then when my meditation ended, my consciousness contracted and I was back into my normal state of consciousness. Then I couldn't figure out when I did meditations after that, why I was not having the same experience every time that I meditated. And I was sort of embarrassed and, you know, ashamedly after a few more weeks, I went up to one of the senior meditators and said, I'm, you know, I must be doing something wrong with my meditation technique. Can you tell me what I'm doing wrong? Because I'm not having that experience all the time when I meditate. And so when I explained what I'd experienced, I remember this person looked at me and their jaw dropped like, that happened to you? 
And I said, yep. Uh, so that was sort of my first clue that that wasn't happening to everybody when they meditated all the time. And, and uh, hello, oh, there we are again. So uh, then he looked at me and he said, well, gee, Yvonne, um, I really don't know what to say. He said, the only thing I've ever heard of that sounds a little bit like what you experienced was a kundalini awakening. But he said, couldn't possibly have been a kundalini awakening. Because kundalini awakenings do not happen to people as young as you are. They don't happen to people who've only been meditating for a few yet, few months. You know, you have to have been meditating for many years in the Himalayas and with a guru or something in order to have a kundalini awakening. So he said, I don't know what it is. So I didn't know what it was either. But I did notice that after this, I started having recurrent experiences of energy rushes up my spine. I started hearing inner sounds. So this was all my last year in medical school. So I didn't want to uh, distract myself from my studies. So I just continued meditating and didn't know what that was. Then. The universe wanted to continue my spiritual training as I was continuing my medical training, is how I now look at it. So when I was in the final year of my residency training, so I was already a medical doctor, I was now doing my family practice residency, is when I had my next really powerful STE, spiritually transformative experience. That is when I had what I now know was my first adult near-death experience. And so I'm going to tell you the story of that experience right now. So what happened to me, so this is my last year as a resident, and I had been assigned um, to work in a place in northern Ontario called Sioux Lookout, and uh, I was looking after Native Indian uh, patients there in a small little remote hospital. On this particular day, um, I was assigned on a medevac of a critically ill uh, Native Indian woman, which was being done by a small airplane. And the airplane was a twin propeller airplane called a Piper Aztec. Does anybody here know what that is? A couple of people. OK, all right. So it's not one of these fancy helicopters. The twin propeller plane. So myself, the patient, the nurse, and the pilot were in this plane, and the plane was full. That, that's how small a Piper Aztec is. The patient was on a stretcher. She had two IV bags hung up by the window clip somehow. She was intubated, which meant she had a tube down her throat, and she was hooked up to oxygen, and there was this bag called an Ambu bag that I had to be squeezing in order to pump air into her lungs. She was not conscious at this point. So I'm on this medevac, and the plane is in the air. We were flying to Winnipeg in order to bring her to a larger hospital there that had an ICU with more advanced equipment and stuff to look after her in her declining condition. So the plane flew into a blizzard, flew into a bad winter storm. And what the presume in the inquest that happened afterwards was that the air filters for both of the propeller engines froze over somehow with the snow and the ice of uh, the storm. And what happened was first one propeller stopped, and then the other propeller stopped, which means there were no propellers going anymore. So if you've ever wondered, like, would you miss it if a plane is crashing? The answer is no, you won't miss it. <laughs> because when the plane is going down, it buffets with horrible turbulence. It's like the worst turbulence you've ever, you've ever experienced. So the plane was buffeting, going down to the ground. We're in the heavy winds of this storm. And the pilot was heroically trying to sort of steer it. And he was trying to do um, a guided landing. He was trying to guide it so that we would Rather than crashing into the forested hills that are up there, that there are also many lakes, he was trying to get us over the surface of a frozen lake to try and do a guided crash landing onto the surface of the lake. He did, and at first it seemed like we were going to be all right. But while we were coming down, before he, we even hit the surface of the semi-frozen lake, when we are in that incredible turbulence with no engines, and I realized that we were going to crash. My first reaction was, it came out of my heart just spontaneously, incredible fear. And out of my heart came, God help, we're gonna die. 
And just as a thought, it just popped out of my heart. And it seems to me that that was close enough to a prayer that that is the moment that my near-death experience began. So it actually began before the plane had crashed. And what happened was, all I would like you know, fear and panic and the, the turbulence, all of a sudden, this force field of peace descended upon me. And it was like it was physically pushing away the fear that I had been feeling. And suddenly I felt still. I felt peace. I felt calm. And then I heard a voice in my mind say, be still and know that I am God. I am with you now and always. And with those words, there was just this profound sense of safety and peace that permeated my soul. Then the plane crashed, and the, the pilot managed to sort of crash glided onto the surface of the ice, and we were sliding, 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 and it looked like we were going to be all right, that the plane just had to come to a stop. But when the plane finally did come to a stop, we were at the edge of the ice right next to open water, where the ice was really thin, and, and as soon as the place, plane stopped, its weight settled, and it broke the ice and sank very rapidly. So we had to get out of the plane really, really quickly uh, before the plane sank and took us down. Um, I managed to get out, uh, the pilot managed to get out. I was trying to pull the nurse on her, I mean the, the patient on her stretcher out of the plane. The nurse, um, she said that I actually pulled her out, so I, I must have done that at the same time. And we were pulling, 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 trying to get the patient out when the plane suddenly nosedived and went down into very deep water. And we found ourselves, it was Lake of the Woods by Kenora is where we, we crashed, if any of you might know where that is. It does border on the United States up there. And um, the place that we crashed was a part of the lake which is called Devil's Gap. <laughs> And it's called Devil's Gap because of the strong current there. That, and the current is so strong that it's treacherous in the summer, but also in the winter because of the strong current. That's why the ice doesn't form there, that the current is too strong. So that was why the ice didn't support the plane and sank. And we had to swim through that area of water with the strong current, the Devil's Gap. The treacherous can't swim it in summer. In the winter, wearing heavy winter clothes, wearing boots that were like weights pulling us down when they were wet, wearing heavy winter parka, all of that to try to get to the closest shore. So the pilot started shouting immediately, try to get on the ice, try to get on the ice, try to get on the ice, when the plane went up, sunk through the, the ice and we found ourselves in the water. And the voice in my head said, swim to shore. And I remember looking at that long stretch of open water. This is in a storm, you know, blowing snow and cold, and the water is a fast current, and the shore was far away, maybe 200 yards. And I remember arguing with the voice. Now, hopefully now, at this point in my life, I wouldn't argue with my higher guidance, but this was all sort of new to me. So I argued, I argued with this inner voice, and I went, I'm not going to swim to shore. That's too far. You know, I'm going to drown trying to swim to shore. So instead, I did what the pilot said, that, that was, I was trying to get on the ice, but the ice was not thick enough. And that every time I struggled and tried to get on top of the ice, the ice would break off underneath my arms. And I was getting more tired and more tired and, and colder and colder. And again, the voice said, swim to shore. But I kept ignoring it. No, 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 that won't work. And, and trying to get on the ice. Finally, the third time, the voice went, swim to shore. 
I finally surrendered to that wisdom and I started swimming to shore. And that is what saved my life. So it was a very long and a very difficult swim. And as I mentioned, I was wearing heavy parka and boots and they were just pulling me down like lead weights into the water. Fortunately, I was a very strong swimmer at that age. And um, I went under several times in the process of swimming to shore, where just out of sheer exhaustion, I would just sink under the water and my lungs would start filling up with lake water. But it really is sink or swim in that situation that somehow with every bit of strength in my physical body, I would kick my way back up to the surface again and spit the water out of my lungs and, and breathe in some air. And then I would continue sort of stroke by stroke trying to inch my way closer to shore. So somewhere in the process of swimming to shore is when my near-death experience deepened using our current vocabulary about near-death experiences. And what happened was, all of a sudden, I heard that rushing or roaring noise like I had with my kundalini awakening. It was like a whoosh, like the rush of a waterfall. And all of a sudden, I found myself not in my body anymore. I seemed to be like 20 or 30 feet above my body, looking down and watching it while it was continuing to swim to shore. Now, it's a more complicated than that. It's not even that straightforward because a part of my consciousness was still in that body. It's more like my consciousness was two places at once, like a split screen TV where you have a big image where most of my consciousness would be like the big image on the split screen TV. And most of my consciousness was 20 or 30 feet above my body. But then there's this little image in the corner of the screen, a smaller uh, image, and that was like the little portion of my consciousness that was still in my physical body that was struggling to swim to shore. So the majority of my consciousness then rose even higher. And it rose into this place that was filled with light. So you've heard lots of NDE experiencers, I think, talk about their experience in the light. For me, the most profound part of my time in the light was the powerful, powerful, powerful feeling of love, profound, unconditional love. And it felt like I was home. It felt like I was exactly where I belonged. It felt like um, finding my way home back to mother. You know, I'm with my mother now. It was all was right with the universe. This is exactly where I was meant to be. This is where I belong. This is where I am completely loved. Uh, this is the shoe that fits. I am home. It was the most profoundly beautiful experience I had ever had in my life. And while I was in this realm of light, for a second, I saw like this face, and I did not recognize that face and a luminous face of light, and I'm still to this day not 100% certain who or what that face of light was. But then it sort of faded into the background of diffused light. And I knew things, not because I was shown things visually or told things in words. I just somehow knew things when I was in this realm of life. I just knew it because they became obvious to me somehow. And so what was obvious to me was that what I was experiencing, this love that I was experiencing, was the love of the higher power or what I had been raised to call God. And it was not at all like what I had been taught that God was like. Because I had been taught something like, you know, an old man on the throne with a long white beard who's up there sort of scolding and judging us. Have you been good? Have you been bad? And I was not experiencing anything like that at all. What I was experiencing was that the higher power 
was loving, profoundly loving, and infinitely intelligent, infinitely intelligent, and permeating all of creation, every li living being, even not living things, everything was, was permeated by this loving, super intelligent, higher power. And, and all was perfect with the universe. I also knew that what I think of as me, what I think of as I, would live on whether or not my body lived on down below. And somehow I knew that this was true for everyone, right? That, that everyone was loved as I was feeling this love. And everyone would live on after their body died, just as I would live on if my body were to die below. Anyway, so my body continued to struggle to swim below, you know, in the little screen in the corner, my body's still struggling to swim to shore. And it looked like I was not going to make it to shore. And I remember I was maybe about 20 feet from shore and I was just so exhausted, my body just didn't have the strength to swim those last 20 feet. And I remember thinking, you know, it's funny how your own mind sort of pops in in a bubble. <laughs> and my own mind popped in and thought, oh, isn't that interesting? You do really die the third time you go down and drowning. <laughs> Anyway, I remember thinking that, and so, but I was completely ready to, to surrender to death because I had absolutely no fear of that transition because most of me was on the other side already anyway. And I remember just like surrendering to let go to death. And then all of a sudden I saw, saw through the physical body of my eyes that the current was carrying me very rapidly to the right. and. If I looked down to my right, there was a, a tall pine tree that had fallen off the shore of the island, and it was projecting into the lake. And so the current was actually carrying me right towards the tip of this tall pine tree. And in that paranormal state that I was in that day, it actually physically looked to me like there was an etheric hand of light superimposed on that tree and that that hand was reaching out to me. So that all I had to do is allow the current to carry me and swim about and do about one more stroke and then I would be able to contact that tree, which is exactly what happened. And then I was able to pull myself along that tree and finally make it to shore. Now, a lot of coincidences, if you believe in coincidences, led to my rescue. And just because I have five near-death experiences I want to tell you about today, I'm not going to go into detail into all of the coincidences that led to my rescue. But to make a long story short, the only vessel that could possibly have come to where I swam to shore and then later the pilot swam to shore would have been a helicopter. And normally uh, there's no helicopter anywhere in that region, but by coincidence on that particular day, at that particular time, there was a helicopter that just happened to put down about five miles from where we crashed. And so the helicopter pilot and um, another pilot who he just met when he put down, they got in the helicopter and they started looking for us. And just by coincidence, when the time that we crashed, uh, the pilot managed to radio out a mayday message that we had crashed because of the storm and the hilly country where we had been, that nobody would even have picked up this SOS message unless there had been aircraft flying virtually directly overhead, and there was. A regularly scheduled Air Canada flight was flying high overhead, so they were able to relay back to the ground where exactly we had crashed, and the, the helicopter picked up that message, so they were able to find us. Now, they were looking for wreckage because, you know, around there everything's frozen or it's trees, so they figured either wreckage in the trees or wreckage crashed on the surface of the ice. And so at first they couldn't find us, 
But again, by coincidence, something had come out of the plane, maybe a seat cushion or something, and had been floating in the open water uh, of Devil's Gap. And so when they couldn't find us, they said, well, you know, could they possibly have gone into that little tiny patch of open water? And we did see something floating. So they went back there, and then they finally saw us uh, on the land and risking their lives very, very heroically, um, rescued the nurse, the pilot, and myself, and flew us all to Kenora Hospital, which was the closest hospital. They landed the helicopter on the driveway, and the emergency staff came out with their gurneys and put us on the gurneys and wheeled us into the emergency room. Now, I was watching all of this from above, and and I remember watching as the nurses were trying to take my temperature in the hospital. And I remember watching the nurse sort of puzzled because she couldn't figure out why she was not getting a temperature reading when she was taking my temperature. And that was because she was using a standard thermometer and I was so frozen, so hypothermic that I was below the bottom reading on her thermometer. And I could feel my consciousness starting to slip further and further away from my physical body. And I knew that I was dying, and that was fine. I, had, I was in a state of love and bliss and ecstasy. And then all of a sudden, I heard a voice say, boy, oh, could I use a hot bath? <laughs> and I was surprised to see that it was my own physical body who had said those words. Because like, I was not thinking that, but that is what came out of my physical body. So I don't know, one of my guardian angels or spirits spoke that through my body. And then the nurses looked at each other and said, gee, maybe that would help us. So they wheeled us down to the physiotherapy department, finally took off our ice encrusted clothes, and then submerged us in the hot whirlpool baths to reheat our bodies. So it was there in the hot whirlpool bath where they reheated my body that I felt my consciousness re-enter my body. And what it felt like was like this. So I was in this expansive place up above and then I'd imagine, you know, how they depict when genie sucked into a bottle very rapidly, very quickly, and it felt like through the top of my head, I felt myself sucked back into my body. And then suddenly, I was back. And then suddenly, I knew that uh, it was going to live. And I remember rubbing my frozen hands against my legs in the whirlpool bath, going, I'm back, I'm back, I'm going to live. <laughs> You know, and probably the nurses wrote on my chart confused or something like that, but I wasn't confused. I was just joyous to be back. So this near-death experience in 1979, in, at the end of my mes medical residency, had really, really powerful, powerful after effects on me. First off, when I, when I first came back, it was like some of that love that I experienced on the other side came with me. And I was just oozing love for the first little while. And I remember I would look outdoors and I'd see the squirrels playing in my yard and I'd have these waves of love for the squirrels playing in my yard. You know, I would look down the street and I would see the children riding their bicycles or something and I'd have waves of love for these children down the street. Similarly, when I listened to music, oh my goodness, I would listen to music and you know, anything about love, of course, waves of love came out of my heart. Any Anything about you know being a social service or or just about anything would just make waves of love come out of my heart. So I was just oozing love. I had been feuding with my father for many years, as young adults and teenagers often do. And when I came back from this near-death experience, I was so filled with love that I called up my dad and I said, Dad, I love you, let's be friends. And we did, we reconciled, we, and we ended up having seven wonderful years of a father-daughter relationship. My father hadn't changed one iota. I had changed based on that near-death experience. Issues that had been seemed so important to me before that NDE, they just didn't matter anymore. All that mattered was I loved my dad and he loved me. 
And to me, that was one of the greatest blessings I got out of that near-death experience. Then much to my surprise, a couple weeks after this, I had my first uh, clairvoyant experience. And we now know that many people who have near-death experiences have psychic awakenings afterwards, various forms. But back then, I didn't even know this was a near-death experience. And certainly, we didn't know that after this, you would be open to various psychic phenomena. I was driving home from work one day. And suddenly, when I was stopped at an intersection at a red light, I got this clear visual image in my mind of my friend's brain covered in pus. And somehow I knew exactly who it was, my friend that I was going to visit that day, and I knew that she had meningitis. How I knew that, I do not know. But sure enough, when I went to visit her, she wasn't feeling well, and later on that day, she was, in fact, diagnosed with meningitis at the hospital, fortunately treated with IV antibiotics and fully recovered. So this was the first of many clairvoyant experiences that I've had uh, since that time. So as, as someone once tell, told me, she said, I've developed the clairs after my near-death experience. <laughs> Clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience. So yes, <laughs> I developed the clairs after my near-death experience. So I'll be telling you more about the, the clairs later on. I also completely lost my fear of death. I absolutely knew the higher power was real. And I knew that the higher power loved everyone with unconditional love. Doesn't matter what path you're on or if you're on no path at all, we were all equally loved by the higher power. I really, really struggled to try and find names for what happened to me. Because you know, back in the 70s, um, people didn't know about near-death experiences yet. And they certainly didn't know about kundalini awakenings or psychic awakenings. This was all considered proof. You know, this was all hallucinations or imagination or sign of mental illness. There was, as far as the medical profession was concerned, uh, there was no reality to any of these phenomena at all. When I I talked to some of my medical colleagues because I worked at a University of Toronto teaching hospital. I, I graduated my residency and then I started teaching at the uh, University Hospital, Women's College Hospital in Toronto. And so I, I asked my medical colleagues, have you ever heard of anything like what happened to me in this plane crash? Because all my colleagues had heard about the plane crash, but not all of them had heard about my, what we now know as my near-death experience. And they listened to me and they all respected me because I was, uh, had a good reputation as a medical doctor. And, but I remember each and every doctor I spoke to had a hallucination theory, that it was a hallucination, that it was a hallucination brought on by a low blood sugar, one person said. A uh, hallucination brought on by an electrolyte imbalance, somebody else said. So there were various hallucination theories. And none of that resonated as truth with me. It was like, no, this was no hallucination. Then there was a person in the Toronto area who considered himself an expert on near-death experiences at the time. So I went and talked to this person. And I said, so uh, do you think my, maybe this was a near-death experience? And so this person told me, absolutely no. It is definitely not a near-death experience. And because I had not been clinically dead, well, it's true, I was not dead while I was swimming to shore, so clearly I was not dead during that point, and I never was dead. At best, I was unconscious, maybe at one point. And he also said, did you see a tunnel with a light at the end? And I said, no, I didn't see a tunnel with a light at the end. And so definitively, I was told it was not a near-death experience, okay. So I was stuck with, okay, the, the earlier experience I was told was not a kundalini awakening. The, the plane crash experience was not a near-death experience. So what were these experiences that were happening to me? So this propelled me as a medical doctor to start researching diverse types of spiritual and paranormal experiences that people were actually having. 
And you know, at first, the best name I could find for the experience that happened in my 1979 plane crash was a mystical, hello, there we go, a mystical experience. And that finally when I heard the word mystical experience, it was like my heart sang, you know, it vibrated, yes. Okay, finally we have a name to call this experience. So for approximately 10 years after my 1979 plane crash experience, I called it my mystical experience that happened in the plane crash. It was only in 1990 when I first met Kenneth Ring. And Kenneth Ring, some of you may know, is one of the co-founders of IONS International, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. And with knocking knees as a young doctor, I felt you know, in awe of one of these founders of IONS. I had the audacity to go up to him and say, I think you don't have to be clinically dead to have a near-death experience, because I think mine was a near-death experience, and I was never clinically dead. So I was waiting, waiting for his wrath. And Ken Ring just burst out laughing, and he said, Yvonne, you are absolutely correct. You do not have to be clinically dead to have a near-death experience. We now realize many people are having them when they're facing death and also when they're in critical illness. And other people, they are clinically dead and then coming back. Now, I see Diane standing there. Is this supposed to be a visual clue that you want me to take a break now? <laughs> She's allowed me two minutes. <laughs> All right. So over these years between um, my near-death experience and when I met Kenneth Ring, many, many patients came to my medical office, my practice at Women's College Hospital in Toronto, and they sort of heard via the grapevine that it was okay to talk to me, that I was a person who wouldn't automatically, you know, give them a, a psychotic, psychotic prescription or something like that or refer them to a psychiatrist, that I would listen to their story. And I heard so many stories that touched me so deeply from highly, highly credible people who had had to live like a double life or be in the closet because nobody would believe them or honor that they had a near-death experience, a mystical experience, a kundalini awakening, past life recall, some sort of psychic experience, that, that I realized that something needed to be done so that both society and the medical profession would stop labeling everybody as crazy who's having some sort of spiritually transformative experience. So I'm, I'm almost at where I'm going to break, Diane. <laughs> so 1990 is when I came out of the closet. And when I had a very strong, what in my book, I did my new book, which is available there, uh, Touched by the Light, a calling mystical experience where spirit made it clear to me what I now must do. I now must go public. I now must start talking that I have had a near-death experience. There are many people having spiritually transformative experiences. They are not crazy. We are doing harm by calling people crazy. So in 1990, I became the first Canadian medical doctor to specialize my medical practice in the counseling and research of people who've had near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative experiences. And then I started public speaking, and then I wrote books, and this is my earlier book. And uh, I coined the phrase spiritually transformative experiences back in 1994 because I wanted us to embrace the whole range of spiritual experiences people are having because NDEs are just one of them. So NDEs, mystical experiences, kundalini awakening, psychic awakening. Now Diane's giving me the big act signal, so I think we are about to break and I will keep talking more after the break. 
So uh, before the break, I told you how in 1990, um, I had a very strong calling experience, and afterwards I started speaking publicly about near-death experiences, diverse spiritually transformative experiences, and advocating for people, trying to make it so that the medical profession would stop labeling everyone as crazy who's had any sort of spiritually transformative experience. I have to mention here too, it's not just the medical profession who was doing it, as many of you know. It's also the general public, family members, friends, and it was also often the churches. Clergy people were saying this was work of the devil, or it was hallucinations, or it was evil to talk about it. So all in all, people were be feeling that they were not safe to talk about their spiritually transformative experiences. So that has been my calling for many, many years to make this safe so it's not labeled as hallucinations, work of the devil, etc. So after I started writing books, the good Lord, as I look at it, wanted to keep reminding me that uh, about the variety of near-death experiences, why don't we call it that? Because in 1995, I had yet another near-death experience uh, in a near-miss plane accident. And because um, time, I, there's a number of things I want to talk about today, I'm going to be in a little bit less detail about the next four near-death experiences, so if you want the full details, you're going to have to read my new book, Touched by the Light, but I will tell you the, the main points about my other near-death experiences. So in 1995, what happened was it was a near-miss plane incident, this time in a large commercial airline. It was an Air Canada flight from Edmonton to Toronto, and I had been in Edmonton speaking about my then book, Farther Shores, and talking to a group there on that weekend, and I was flying back to Toronto, and it was in February of 1995, and of course, you guys know what winter is like, snow, ice, etc. This plane flew into an ice storm as we were approaching Toronto. I had a window seat, I could see the ice forming on the wings of the plane, and I remember thinking, gee, they say it was the ice on the air filters that, that was why we crashed. Isn't that interesting? Now we've got ice forming on the wings of the plane. Uh-huh, interesting. And then I remember thinking, gee, we're, we're flying on that route that's probably right over where I crashed and had my near-death experience. Uh, oh, isn't that sort of an interesting coincidence? Anyway, there, there were a number of other things that were making me think about the day that I had had uh, the near-death experience. But we're coming into Toronto International Airport, and I'm looking out the window. Horrible turbulences were coming down because of the storm. And finally, when we were, I don't know, maybe between 50 and 100 feet above the runway was finally when you could see the runway lights because of the storm and the low clouds. You, you couldn't see the runway as you're approaching or the city lights as we're approaching. And I remember when finally I could see the runway lights, there was like, oh, a sense of relief that we were going to make it. But then all of a sudden, the pilots flapped, you know, uh, slapped the flaps of the wings in the opposite direction and they just raced the engines. The engines were screaming and so it was really clear they were trying to abort the landing. Yeah. But it did not seem that they were going to do it because the plane just shook violently with the turbulence and with the engines screaming. And I've heard later from pilots because they had decreased their airspeed so much in preparation for landing. And secondly, because the plane was much heavier than it should normally be because of all the ice that had formed on the entire plane. It hadn't formed just on the wings, but on the entire plane. So he was having a lot of trouble getting enough airspeed to get the plane to take off again. And and the plane was shaking violently. People in the plane started crying and screaming, and other people were throwing up, and I'm gonna die, and stuff like that. And I remember that my immediate thought was, I get, I was meant to survive that other plane crash so that I would do the work that I did and the, write the book that I did and bring out the awareness that I did, but I'm gonna die today in this plane crash. And I just, I had learned in my spiritual search up until that point that if you're going to die, the best way to die is consciously. So I immediately went into meditation. 
I said a prayer for my son because I truly believed I was about to die. My son was my only attachment. He was about five years old at the time. And I surrendered to death. And what happened was instantly my near-death experience started. And I found myself out of body. And this time I did experience the tunnel that I had not experienced before. This time I found myself moving upwards, upwards, upwards. And to me, what it was like was like a dark expanse of space. So I was moving upward, upward, upwards through this dark expanse of space towards the light. The difference this time was that I was swimming with the current because I knew I wanted to get to that other end. So it was like in my meditation, I was pushing myself up towards the light. It was not just that the light was pulling me, but I was also pushing myself there. I was trying to get back home to that light where I'd been before. I, I knew exactly where I was headed and I wanted to go there. And um, then what happened is I had a life review. And again, I have not had a life review in my previous near-death experience, but I did. And how it was for me, it was like I was actually jumping through time. That, you know, like a stone skipping on the water, it was sort of like that, that I was jumping through time, and then when I touched, like the stone landing, I'd be at a certain point in time in my life. And I touched at three points in my life, and they were all peak spiritual experiences that I'd had in my life. So one was when I had the near-death experience in 1979 that I told you about. And it was actually like I had time traveled and that I was there again and I was feeling all the feelings and thinking all the thoughts that I had when I was in that experience. Then I skipped to my calling mystical experience I had in 1990. And again, it was like I time traveled, I was there. And in every sense, surround, sound, sense, sensation, I was experiencing it as if it were that time again. And then I jumped to another very powerful mystical experience I had back in 1993. And then, boop, and then suddenly I was out of the life review and I found myself in this, what the tunnel, what people call the tunnel, but me, it was like a, a space uh, moving upwards. And now the, the color had changed around me. It had changed into a very deep royal blue. And as I was moving upwards, upwards in this royal, dark royal blue light, then suddenly a being of light appeared in front of me. And this being of light was blocking my path towards the light. So it stopped me physically by the body created a barrier. And this being of light was a translucent royal blue, the same royal blue as the surrounding space around me. And this being of light had a most unusual form. It was half male and half female. So the left side appeared to be female, and the right side appeared to be male. And it also had four arms, and the arms were being held in um, specific postures, and one of the legs was held up like as if in a dancing posture. And it looks, the only thing I've seen quite similar to it is you see some statues of a dancing Shiva. Some of you may know what that is. It was held in sort of a posture like that. And this being of light, this extraordinary being of light, telepathically communicated to me, it is not your time. And boom, just like that, I was back in my physical body in the airplane. Now, the, the pilot managed eventually to get the airplane to successfully not crash, to regain altitude. He circled around. He later came on the PA system and said he had to abort the landing at the last minute because he had seen coyotes on the runway. <laughs> and um, anyway, so we finally landed. Uh, I was in, as an after effect, I was in an extraordinary state of consciousness. As the plane landed and I got my baggage from the luggage carousel and went home, I felt like I had no skin. That is the best way to describe it. It felt like there was no boundary between me and everything around me. And when I got home that evening, I, I slept very, very soundly. 
And when I woke up the next morning, I found myself in a state of communion. I felt like where the top of my head used to be, that there was no top of my head anymore, and that I was directly connected to this vast ocean of consciousness that we are all connected to. And, you know, some people might think it's grandiose to say, you know, I was in a unit of state of consciousness. I'm just describing what I was experiencing. And in fact, in the experience, there's nothing grandiose about it at all. It's quite the opposite. It's quite a humbling experience. Because you realize your smallness. It's like realizing that you're a tiny wave of the Pacific Ocean. You're very tiny in compared to the size of the Pacific Ocean. Whereas at the same time, you know you're connected to that very vast ocean. So I sometimes use the metaphor of a millipede, you know, that's a million legs, that each of us is a leg on the millipede, and we're all equally connected to the body of the, the mama millipede. But um, what had happened in my consciousness was that the veil that was blinding the other legs from our communion, our oneness with the millipede, had been removed. So that was really the only difference between me and everyone else, is that I could see, I was living, I was feeling, I was sensing the oneness, but everybody was just as one as I was, but just not able to perceive it. So this profound state of communion is indescribable. I, 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 I strive to try and capture some words to it. It's home, it's being complete. I, didn't ever, I did not speak to people about it. In fact, I did not even tell people about it until spirits prompted me in the last two years to start talking about it. There, there was absolutely no need to tell anybody about it. I lived my life as normal. I went to my office, I saw my patients, I paid my bills, I looked after my son. There's a saying in yoga, they say, before enlightenment, chopping wood and hauling water. After enlightenment, chopping wood and hauling water. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was for those two months period. The psychotherapy work I could do with my psychotherapy patients was phenomenal. A patient would walk into my room, and before they even said anything, uh, somehow by this incredible intuition I had while in this state of consciousness, I would already know what their issues were that they were having problems with, and I would already know how I could best help them. And it, it was absolutely amazing. But what happened over the two-month period is that slowly my consciousness started contracting, and I would have to meditate. I would have to put my focus on my third eye center here and meditate, and then whoosh, my consciousness would expand back into that, that state of union. And over the course of the two months, it got gradually more and more difficult for me to uh, get into that state, and finally, by the end of two months, I was no longer able to do it. And I have been striving to get back into that state of communion ever since. So by far, that was the strongest after effects of any of my near-death experiences. Then came 2003. And 2003 was my most recent near-death experience. And in this one, this was the only time of my five near-death experiences that I was actually clinically dead for a period of time. And, you know, some people have asked me, why do you think you've had so many near-death experiences, Yvonne? And I really don't know. Uh, that's my true answer. But uh, I suppose my best answer is that somehow it's in the divine design. You know, and maybe the divine knew a long time ago that one day in 2019 I was going to be elected president of Alliance, and they wanted someone who had five near-death experiences to be the new president. I really don't know. But having had five near-death experiences has absolutely convinced me, beyond a doubt, that they are real 
that they're not a hallucination, and also that every near-death experience is unique. You know, I'm only up to number three, I haven't told you yet, but you'll see from my story, every near-death experience of my five were different from each other. And so similarly, when you talk to different people who've had near-death experiences, every near-death experience is unique. So there are certain features, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that, that go between various near-death experiences, so we can call them as a group. These are near-death experiences, but every near-death experience is unique. So what was my 2003 near-death experience like? I'm going to give you a, a short version so I can cover some of the additional material I want to talk about, too. So in 2003, November the 8th, 2003, I had a slip and fall accident on black ice in Niagara Falls, Ontario. I fell back and I hit my head on the rock pavement. I had a, uh, a brain hemorrhage and traumatic brain injury and I instantly died. And what I experienced was instantly, my consciousness was out of my body. I found myself rushed up by this force greater than myself through this dark expanse of space, so we're gonna call it the tunnel again. And then this time, I found myself very quickly in the realm of light. So I was back up in the white light realm, and this time, I was being greeted into the white light realm by two beings of light, white light. Beings that I recognized immediately, beings that I loved, two great saints from my particular spiritual tradition, Yogananda and Babaji. And they were welcoming me into the light. And I felt incredible love. I felt incredible joy. I felt like a celebration was being held in my honor, like a graduation party. That I had graduated from what I had to live through in my incarnation as Dr. Yvonne Quezon, and now it was the celebration for arriving on the other side. And then I moved into um, a place, I was telepathically told that I had died, that my work was done, and then I moved into a place of pure consciousness where much information was revealed to me all at once, not in a linear fashion. And where I just knew a vast amount of information all at once somehow. And in that state, I was able to perceive, I knew, I remembered, I could see all my past lives. And I could see how my various past lives all fit together. And it's sort of like having pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, like before I'd known some of my past lives and I'd been holding these pieces individually. But now all the pieces were put together and I could see the whole picture of the jigsaw puzzle and I could see how my various lives fit together. And I had like an aha experience that suddenly my rather unusual life as Dr. Yvonne Quezon suddenly made sense to me in the context of my many past lives. And by the way, one of the things I had the aha about was this incarnation is not the first time I've had a near-death experience. And this incarnation is not the first time I've had spiritually transformative experiences. So it's like, okay, I get it, you know, this, this came with me from before. So a lot of things made sense. And then after a period of what I call timeless time, because time did not seem to pass the same on the other side as it does here, um, it felt to me that the amount of time I had on the other side was a lot longer than the amount of time that had passed here on the earthly plane. Suddenly the beings of light appeared to me again and telepathically communicated to me that it was now time for me to choose and that I could choose either to return to the injured body uh, or and or to incarnate in the body of a baby to further serve the Divine Mother, which is how I at that time of my life was relating to the Divine as the Divine Mother. And my soul, it was interesting, because as the soul was given to me, the, sorry, as the question was given to me, 
It was not my head that responded. It actually felt like the answer came out of my heart, you know, as if my heart has a voice. And out of my heart came, oh, please guide me. I want to do the higher choice. What is God's will? And so mentally, I was very lovingly, so gently informed it will be more difficult but to return to the injured body. And then once again, it wasn't my head who thought about it and weighed it over. No, it was my heart that instantly responded. I accept. And faster than the speed of thought, it was between the I and the accept is when I woke up in my previously dead or unconscious, I don't know, physical body. And it was like this, I <gasps> accept. So the gasp was between the I and accept of I accept. And so the first few moments, I could see both realms at the same time. I could see the realm of light, and I could see the two saints, the two beings of light right in front of me. And then I could also see the earthly realm that I had now in, you know, re-embodied in my physical body. And um, then I was back. But I was back with a serious traumatic brain injury. And I was disabled for 12 years due to this traumatic brain injury. Um, I did neuro rehab for seven years because I very, very much wanted to go back to the work that I was doing, advocating for NDE years and STE years and my writing and my public speaking and volunteering in my son's school, all the things that I used to do. But I was flattened by the near-death, by the traumatic brain injury. And in terms of the after effects of my NDE, this particular time, it was like that near-death experience was like a life ring for me in the really tumultuous, trying storm that my physical life became with my new disability. And so all the challenges I had to face. And then sometimes people can say very cruel and insensitive things to somebody who has a serious accent and develops a disability. Like people would say things to me like, oh boy, Yvonne, you must really have some bad karma that this would have happened to you. And, and that, that near-death experience, the love that I felt in the light, and the love that I felt when I was given the choice whether to come back into the disabled form or to um, go in the body of the baby, I knew absolutely that I was loved by the divine as everyone is, I absolutely knew that this was not some sort of punishment or some sort of bad karma. I, I knew there was some wisdom in why it had unfolded this way. And somehow my faith was so strong that I could literally hang on to that faith when people would say some of those cruel things around me. So what I did is I focused very much on my faith, now that I'd become disabled and I had accepted that doing things like speaking to you guys or writing new books or volunteering on the IANS board was all part of my past and I accepted that. And I embraced that for whatever reason in the divine plan, I was no good, now gonna have a quiet inward life where I would help others through my prayers and meditation. So, but the good Lord had a surprise for me. Because suddenly, in 2016, on February 24th, 2016, while I was meditating at a meditation retreat in Encinitas, California, I had a sudden, spontaneous, brain-healing experience while I was meditating. And what I experienced was it was like an eruption of light in the center of my brain. I could see it with my inner eye. It was like this, this inner uh, fountain of light erupted in the center of my brain. And it felt like the center of my brain, literally, the lights came on. That, that this part of my center of my brain had been asleep for 12 years, it seems, since I had the traumatic brain injury. And it suddenly woke up 
and I'm back. <laughs> Yvonne version 2.0 standing in front of you. My, my close friends sometimes laugh and say I was pulled out uh, for refurbishment for 12 years and then now this is Yvonne version 2.0 who's come back. So I stand before you today. So to me, this was a miracle. It shows the power of um, meditation, and it also shows the grace of God. And so my message to people is never give up hope. You know, healings are always possible. And I never imagined 12 years after being totally disabled that through the grace of God, one day I would suddenly be healed. But I am, and I stand in front of you right now. So after that healing, I, I, I spirit reawoke my inspired creativity, and I started writing books again. So the book that I have here, Touched by the Light, is the first book that I wrote after my brain healing. And as I was starting to write this book and I'm reflecting on my near-death experiences, it suddenly came to me that I realized these, that I had two experiences in my childhood that I always remembered, I've always remembered these, but it had never dawned on me that they were near-death experiences. So something happened about two years ago that the, 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 you know, the neurons connected and I realized, oh my goodness, I also had two near-death experiences when I was a child. And the first one happened when I was five years old I was almost hit by a train, and I still have a clear memory where as a tr I, I was on a train platform and I decided that I was going to jump and climb up on the next platform, not noticing a train was approaching, coming into the station. So I inadvertently was jumping right in front of an ongoing train, and a little five-year-old, and suddenly I'm out of body, I'm up above, I'm looking down, and I realized in this state of peace and calm, oh, I'm about to be hit by a train. And then suddenly a hand came from nowhere, shh, pulled me back, pulled me back onto the, the platform, and the train whisked in front of me, and I was not hit. So my parents, of course, scolded me, blah, blah, blah. How I, as a five-year-old, understood that experience is I thought I could fly. And I remember that, that was the summer before kindergarten, but in kindergarten, I would, I would climb up on the fence in front of my house, I'd put my arms up, and I would jump off trying to fly. And I just could not figure out why I couldn't fly, because I had such a clear memory of what, as a five-year-old, I thought was flying when I had that near-death experience. So that's how I understood the near-death experience and uh, until recently. Then at age 11, my family was involved in a car accident. We were all quite seriously injured. And um, I had a head injury in this car accident. And I was unconscious for three days. I was taken to hospital and I was unconscious for three days. And I have always, all my life, had a very clear memory of floating above the accident scene, you know, seeing my injured father, um, and then another memory of being uh, above my body while we, I was in the emergency department and the doctors huddled over my body trying to resuscitate me, etc. I could see the large circular emergency room lamp, but I was seeing it from the top down. And as an 11-year-old child, I would have no have had no idea what an emergency room lamp looked like, especially from a top-down version. Anyway, and then I have a clear memory of returning to my body. Now, that I now realize was those both those experiences were childhood near-death experiences. The, the second one at age 11, for about a year afterwards, the after effect that I now realize was an after effect was I could see ghosts. That was how I interpreted it as, a, as an 11 year old. And I thought my house was haunted. And I insisted on sleeping in the bedroom with my younger brother and sister. I wouldn't sleep in my own bedroom for quite some time because I was frightened by these ghosts that I was seeing at night. 
And so that eventually went away. But this is how I've come to understand, oh my goodness, I had two near-death experiences as a child. And maybe this has predisposed me to having so many near-death experiences as an adult. So now I'm going to move forward to um, the content part of the topic. So International Association for Near-Death Studies is um, sort of the mother organization. This is Chicago IANS, and as I just mentioned, I recently been elected the president of IANS. So I'm going to share with you for the last portion of our last half hour or so that we have, um, what I've learned in 40 years of researching NDEs and spiritually transformative experiences, together with a synopsis, sort of melded together with a synopsis of what I am as an organization, all the various researchers have learned about near-death experiences in the last 40 years. So what is IANS? Very briefly, uh, some people told me, gee, I didn't realize there was a, a mother center IANS outside of Chicago IANS. Yes, Chicago IANS is uh, the Chicago Friends of IANS. There are many um, cities around the U.S. that have IANS groups. Some of you may know some of these other groups. I've mentioned a few, Denver, um, San Diego, Seattle, uh, Philadelphia, all over the United States there are groups. There are also international groups in Canada, in Mexico, in England, in France. So um, there are many IANS groups around the world, but there's also the IANS International Headquarters. And so the IANS International was founded back in 1978, incorporated in 1981. It's a 501c organization, not-for-profit which means I, as president, am not paid. It's a volunteer position. We have a volunteer board. We do have an office in North Carolina that has a full-time staff and a couple part-time staff. We have a newsletter. We have local groups all over. We also have started online sharing groups. And we have the Journal of Near-Death Studies. So if some of you are not members of Mother IANS, you can join up and you can take part in some of the online sharing groups, see some of the online material that Mother IANS has, or even come to our international conferences. The next international conference is going to be in Salt Lake on Labor Day weekend. And some of you might want to speak at our international conferences, so uh, you might be interested in doing that too. And the goal of IANS since its creation is threefold, which is number one, to support experiencers, uh, two, to do research for those people who need research validation to believe that this is real, and then three, education, to educate experiencers and the public and professionals about near-death experiences. Now, near-death experiences have been reported for centuries. We did not invent it here in the United States 40 years ago. This is a painting from 1505, approximately, by Heronius Bosch, called Ascent of the Blessed. And it looks pretty clear. You know, there's a tunnel with a white light at the end, and it seems to be little spirits going up the tunnel accompanied by angels. So that seems to be a, a pretty clear depiction of either the death transition or a near-death experience. But the term near-death experiences was coined by Dr. Raymond Moody, and I believe he's been here to this group not too long ago, in his 1975 book, Life After Life. Then IANS International was co-founded by a group of doctors and researchers back in 1978. This is a picture of how some of them looked like. Bruce Grayson, there's Kenneth Ring in the bottom when he was young. <laughs> Michael Sebaum, John Odette, and also Raymond Moody, who's not in this picture. And how are we defining a near-death experience according to IANS? It's a, near, it's a profound phenomenon or psychological event that typically occurs when a person is close to death, clinically dead, or under physical or emotional trauma. I personally like this definition better, which is that it's an out-of-body and or white light mystical experience and it occurs when a person is close to dead, clinically dead, or facing imminent death or severe trauma. And the important thing about this is that you have to have both, okay? 
So if you have an out-of-body experience while you're having your morning coffee and there's no risk to you of imminent death or trauma, that is called an out-of-body experience. That is not a near-death experience. Similarly, if you are close to dead or clinically dead and resuscitated, but you have nothing out of the ordinary other than a close call, then you've had a close call. It is not a near-death experience. Out there, some of the media and some of the public are, are getting confused, and so they're calling every out-of-body experience a near-death experience, or every time they have a close call, they're calling it a near-death experience. To, to meet the IANs and people who are researching and, and professionals in the field, to meet the criteria, you have to have both. So it's the out-of-body and or mystical experience that happens when you are close to death or clinically dead and resuscitated. So what is the frequency of near-death experiences? Well, some of the current research, Dr. Pim von Lummel from Holland did a really excellent study um, that was published in 2001, but it, it's done incredibly well. He's a cardiologist, so he was working with patients where they were documented, you know, their brains were hooked up, their hearts were hooked up, the cardiac arrests where they're clinically dead, no brain activity, and then resuscitated successfully. And then he asked these patients, how many of you recall that while you were dead, clinically dead, that you had an out-of-body or a white light mystical experience? And he found that 12% said yes. So that means one in eight of his cardiac arrest patients reported a near-death experience. But that also means seven out of eight did not. Right? So not everybody has a near-death experience when they're close to clinical death. I'm just going to scoot on now. Now, what are the features of a near-death experience? I'm going to go through this rather quickly. Um, but there are classic features of a near-death experience that Dr. Raymond Moody first defined back in 1975. And these are still the diagnostic features used by most um, researchers and clinicians who are working in the field. And most near-death experiences do not, I would say, all of them. No, none have all of them. So usually it's a portion, maybe seven, eight, nine of the symptoms. So first off, near-death experiences are ineffable. That means they're beyond words. That, that you really cannot describe in words because it's an experience. It's a, they're feelings that you actually have to have the experience to really get what it's, what it's about. And what I sometimes say to people to compare it to, it's like falling in love. So if you try to, if you're in love, and you've fallen head over heels in love, and you're trying to explain to somebody who's never been in love what it feels like to be in love, you can try. You can, you can try to put words to how it feels, but they will really never get how it feels until they fall in love themselves. And then they go, ah, oh, this is what they were trying to convey. So that's what ineffable is. It's a, it's a lived feeling experience that's beyond words. Auditory awareness is another early symptom in near-death experiences where people might be dead or unconscious, but they accurately hear conversations that are being said around their dead or unconscious bodies. The next symptom is the strong feeling of peace that, that almost all near-death experiencers um, report the strong feeling of peace coming on with their NDE. So they're no longer feeling afraid. They're not feeling any physical pain. So this is a very, very common feature. Fourth, unusual inner sound. So I told you with, with, with two of my experiences, two of my five, I heard that strong rushing or roaring sound. Later on in my experiences, uh, particularly the 1979 one, I heard like a, a musical sort of tinkling sound, sort of like a music of the spheres. So other people also, other into ears report musical sounds. Some people report hearing a sound that sounds more like ohm. Um, then the going out of body, the out of body experience, very common feature. 
Um, usually people report that they feel like they've risen above their body, but sometimes people say that they're beside their body or near the head of their body or by the foot of their body. So it's not always above the body, although that is the most commonly reported. And some people actually experience that they travel to nearby rooms. So they're, they're above the ceiling, the nearby room, they can see their parents in the room beside of where they were unconscious, or even travel to the home where their parents are some distance. So not everybody stays within view of their um, dead or unconscious body. So next is the famous dark tunnel or the dark space where it feels like a person is moving upward through this darkness towards a light. And then a life review. Now, a life review is actually not that common a feature, but sometimes when people have a life review, it can be uh, a very profound, life-changing part of their experience. So there's a great deal of variety in terms of whether people have a life review or not. And even the life review itself can vary tremendously. My life review was on um, uh, three of my peak experiences. Other people feel like they somehow re-experienced all of their life experiences. Other people have told me that when they had their near death, their life review, that they were experiencing not only their own thoughts and feelings, but they were able to mentally uh, understand, feel, know what other people around them were thinking and feeling, so they knew uh, well, the impact of their actions on other people. So it can be a profoundly um, humbling and growth-promoting uh, process, this life review. Meaning spirits is another symptom and of a near-death experience. So, and often it could be spirits of deceased loved ones. It can be, uh, children will often see pets. <laughs> it can be saints. It can be angels. It can also be spirits of deceased relatives that you never knew, like a grandfather that you never knew, or a, a, an aunt that you never knew, your mother who died in childbirth, that uh, it's not necessarily somebody that you knew, the, the spirits. Then, of course, the white light realm. And uh, I've talked a little bit about that, but it's a realm that's experienced with intense, unconditional love, that there's a sense of timelessness, there's a sense of the higher power, that communication is through telepathy rather than speaking, it feels like home. And then some people get a life barrier or a choice whether or not to return to the physical body. Um, other people are just told it's time to go back, other people just suddenly are sent back. And the return, when it does happen, is abrupt. It's not like on the way up where you're going through a light for you and going up the tunnel and finally make it to the light. No, when you go back, it's whoop, suddenly you're back. And so very different from the leaving the body. Another feature, according to Raymond uh, Moody, is the conviction of the reality of the experience. And I add to this that the memory remains exceptionally clear. Like there is something unusual about near-death experiences. If you ask me, what did I have for breakfast that day in 1979 when I had the plane crash? I have no clue, you know, no clue. <laughs> Yet I can remain, I can remember the details of that near-death experience clearly. And this is true for all five of my near-death experiences. And this is pretty universal with near-death experiencers. I've had people tell me about NDEs they had 30, 40, even 50 years ago, World War II veterans, you know, Vietnam War veterans, that years, years, years later, the memory is still really clear in their minds. And I want to mention here something about memory, because there are some people who, for whatever reasons, only remember part of their near-death experience, or actually don't seem to remember it at all for a while, and then the memory comes back later. But when the memory does come back, or the part of the memory that was blocked or forgotten comes back, 
that there's like a healing that happens in the person, that there's a sense that something had been missing, and now that that memory has come back, that, that there's a healing, that things start to make sense. So I just wanted to share that because not everybody has full memory right after the near-death experience. Another feature is the transformational impact, that people are changed after their near-death experiences, psychologically, psychically more open, and spiritually. People lose their fear of death, and then the final feature is veridical perceptions. And what that means, uh, Raymond Moody used the term independent corroboration. That means things that people observed while they're out of body are later confirmed by third parties to be absolutely correct. Things they couldn't possibly have known when they were dead un unconscious unless they actually had been out of body observing it. So what have we learned in 40 years in terms of who has NDEs? The answer is anybody. The old, the young, children in the womb, during childbirth, anybody, old men, women, all faiths, no faiths. Here I listed a whole bunch of circumstances. Just about any circumstance, one can have a near-death experience. What are the types of near-death experiences? Well, there are basically three types we, we now know. So the one type is the out-of-body type of near-death experience. So there are some people that that is their whole near-death experience, that they felt themselves go out of body, they go to this place of peace, and um, they're observing things happening around their body, and then they come back in their body. And some people, because there's been so much on television about you know, the realm of light and going through the tunnel, etc., that's in the second type, the mystical white light near-death experience. They don't realize that their out-of-body experience they had during cardiac arrest and surgery is actually a near-death experience because they, it, it's the out-of-body type of near-death experience. So that's one category of near-death experience. Then there is the second category, which is the mystical or white light type of near-death experience. Now, the second type tends to be far more transformative. Both of these two, first and second type, both tend to open people so they're more susceptible to psychic experiences afterwards and more out-of-body experiences. The mystical one changes people's lives, sometimes um, 180 degrees, uh, highly, highly transformative. I want to talk now about the third type because there is a third type of near-death experience, which is the distressing near-death experience. So not everybody has a positive near-death experience. In my clinical work, I found about three sort of subtypes to the distressing near-death experience. One type are people who are fighting the experience. So people who feel themselves out of body, they don't want to go out of body, they don't want to die, they're trying to fight to get back in their body when this force greater than themselves is pushing them out, pulling them out and pulling them up towards the light. So it's like swimming against an undertow. So they're experiencing this tremendous struggle because they're fighting against the experience. So that is one type of distressing uh, near-death experience people have told me about. A second type, is where the place where people go after they leave their body is not a place that's full of love and light, but it's actually a dark place with dark entities that might be tormenting and they may feel very, very frightened. And, and um, in yoga, we would call this a low astral experience or we might call it a hellish experience. There are some people who have these very distressing, low astral type of experiences. Now the good news is, I've heard of a few cases now where people who've had these distressing NDEs, when it came in their mind to pray, that the near-death experience can switch. It seems like the light seems to help them and bring them up into the white light plane. So you don't have to get stuck in that low plane. And then the third type of distressing near-death experience that I've heard about is sort of nightmarish distortions. And um, in my own mind, I wonder if these are um, 
sort of like distortions and confusion that are brought on perhaps by toxins in the body if they were really, really sick or maybe some of the powerful drugs that they were on that's creating these sort of like hallucination-like images um, that some people report with close calls. Now, spiritually transformative experiences, we've talked about this a little earlier on, Near-death experiences are one type of spiritually transformative experiences. They all tend to change people's values and beliefs in a more spiritual direction, and they all have very similar after effects. I'm gonna move quickly through this so that we'll have time for questions. There are about, there are, in my books, I talk about the five main types of spiritually transformative experiences. Mystical experiences, spiritual energy, kundalini awakening, psychic experiences, NDEs, and other death-related STEs, and inspired creativity and genius. So very quickly, there are many types of mystical experiences, unitive experiences, experiences of union or communion, ecstatic or bliss episodes, mystical visions, where you might have visions of Jesus, visions of angels, visions of saints, visions of Buddha, uh, expansive episodes where it feels your consciousness expands to fill the size of this room, the size of the planet, the size of the cosmos. Spiritual rebirth, religious conversion experiences, revelations or illumination, and finally dissolution experiences. I define all of these and give case examples in my book, Touched by the Light. Spiritual energy or kundalini episodes this is actually described in the diverse spiritual traditions. They might have different names like Holy Wind, Holy Spirit, Dumo Fire in Buddhism. The classic symptoms are people have experiences of energy flows up the body and spine. This may be associated with inner sounds like a rushing, roaring, ringing, or own sound, and associated with light perceptions. And it's also sometimes associated with sexual sensations. And it will culminate in a mystical experience or a psychic out of body, past life, some sort of paranormal experience or an inspired creative experience. And the thing about a kundalini awakening is that once this spiritual energy mechanism has awakened for the first time, it tends to remain active for some degree. And so it leads the person to have recurrent energy rushes, recurrent inner sounds, recurrent light, light perceptions, and also recurrent spiritually transformative experiences of various kinds. Then there are the various types of psychic experiences. So clairvoyance, and that is when you can see things visually that are beyond the range of normal sight. Clear sentience, when you can feel things which are beyond the normal range of feeling. And I want to mention a little more detail about this one, because many, many, many NDEs ears become very clear sentient, and they don't really even know what it is or have a word to describe what it is. So this is what it is, clear sentience. And clear sentience is when you can feel in your body the energy state or the physical state of the people around you. So if you're around people who are angry, that you might feel it like, say, a pressure in your head. Or if you're around somebody who's very sad, that you might feel it as a pressure in your heart. Or you might feel sensations in your physical body that relate to physical pain that somebody is having in their physical body. So you, on a feeling basis, are picking up on people's physical or emotional state. And sometimes when people develop a lot of clairsentience after their STE or if it was an NDE, they find it very difficult to go in crowded places because they're picking up so much on other people's thoughts and feelings and they feel physical discomfort in their bodies. So they have trouble going in airplanes or buses or in the subway. Uh, but usually with time, people learn to uh, shield themselves for the clairsentience so they can handle it. Clear audience is when you can hear things beyond the normal range of hearing or hear messages from the other side. Telepathy, uh, thought transference between persons. Premonitions or precognition. Past life recall. Past life recall is another type of psychic experience that's happening to a lot of people spontaneously and can be an after effect of NDEs. Out of body experience, astral travel, channeling, mediumship, 
I mean, I'm just giving you the range of STEs that people are having. Communication with spirit guides, automatic writing, telekinesis, that's when you can move something with your energy or with your mind. Telepyrokinesis, that is if you have the capacity to start a fire with the power of your mind. Healing abilities, materialization. There are documentations of great saints who are able to materialize things. Eye location. Similarly, there are documented cases of saints who were able to materialize a physical body in more than one location at the same time. Stigmata. And then trans-dimensional experiences. And I want to mention here that I think some uh, things that are being reported as UFO encounters, uh, in my experience, I think are trans-dimensional experiences so that uh, it's happening on another dimension. And trans-dimensional experiences tend to open people to more psychic phenomenon. So uh, I'm going to move on here. I want to mention that psychic experiences are not always spiritual, uplifting, and positive. That according to um, people who work in this realm, this field, there are many layers of astral planes if you think of it like there's some drink of B-52 or something that has all these different layers of different uh, uh, liquids with different densities so that there's, you know, the, the lighter ones are on top and the denser ones are at the bottom. That similarly, there are many astral planes so that if you get out of our particular time, space, continue on and into some of the astral planes, if you go to the realm of light, that we're actually going up to one of the higher spiritual astral planes that sometimes when people are doing channeling and mediumship, they're sort of going sideways, you know, sort of equivalent to our plane of existence. But sometimes it's possible that we might access some of these lower astral planes. So um, some of the frightening negative NDEs might be accessing some of these lower astral planes. So uh, some of the challenging and unpleasant uh, psychic experiences, there may be excessive clairvoyance, seeing things that you don't want to see. Uh, I mentioned before, clear, uh, excessive clairsentience, where people are picking up too much on other people's thoughts and feelings through feeling it in their body. There's a phenomenon of psychic assault, which can be a very traumatic to people. Possession states, there are many psychologists who believe this can occur. We have the negative or frightening NDE, and also the phenomenon of the walk-in. And I just want to mention this also because this is not talked about very much, but there are some people who perhaps have had an experience of being clinically dead or, or even clinically dead and resuscitated several times, but the people around them notice that the person does not have the positive sort of transformation that one would expect after a near-death experience, but there is a marked personality change and sometimes even a negative marked personality change. So I have seen a few cases where uh, it appears to be a walk-in that um, some other entity may have entered the body. Now modern medicine has no understanding of this concept, but um, there are many people who believe they have witnessed this, and I personally believe that I have witnessed this myself. So inspired creativity and genius is the other category of uh, spiritually transformative experiences. I'm just going to move on rapidly. There's also the category of other death-related STEs. And there are three main types here. One is the deathbed vision or the nearing death awareness. And what this is, is that shortly before a person dies, so it could be a few hours before they die, a few days before they die, sometimes it's a few weeks before they die, they may have a, an experience where it seems the veil is, is rent and they can see spirits on the other side, they're talking to departed loved ones, maybe they're seeing their religious figure. And to me, it seems that this is a, a preparation for the final crossing over. Um, so many people have this and then but prior to their actual physical death. Then there is the experience, what I call the death watch experience, or sometimes called a shared death experience. And this happens right at the time that somebody else dies. 
Okay, and the, the, the death watch or shared death experience can take a lot of different forms. It could be that you're at the bedside of someone who's dying and you see their spirit leave as a wisp of light or an orb of light, or you might see an angel, a vision of an angel at the bedside and you see it leave with the spirit. Sometimes people can, uh, if they're remote at a distance from their loved one, all of a sudden see the face of their loved one appear in a mirror right exactly at the time their loved one dies. Or uh, for me with my grandfather, I was asleep at night. Suddenly I had a dream that was more vivid than a dream and it was my grandfather's luminous face. And I woke up and sure enough, I got the phone call a few minutes later that my grandfather had died. Sometimes people can get the physical symptoms of their loved one who's dying, like double over with chest pain, suddenly think of their father, and then get the news five or 10 minutes later that their father had just died of a massive heart attack with chest pain. So, and then the last category of death watch or shared death experience is helping people cross over, what I call the ushering experience. So sometimes people can hear a confused soul or see a confused soul and feel that they're being called to help that, that soul find their way to the light at the moment of death. And other people feel themselves pulled out of their body and that they've gone on the other side and they're there with a confused soul and they feel intuitively somehow that their role is to help guide and usher that confused soul to get into the light. So this is some of the spectrum of shared death and death, and death watch experiences. And then the third, third death-related STE I wanted to share with you is the after-death communication, which probably you've heard about, and that is when it seems that the spirit of somebody who died some time ago, could be days, weeks, or even months ago, seems to want to be communicating intuitively with an individual. So there are a lot of physical after effects that one can have after a near-death experience or an STE. I'm going to quickly go through some of these. Less tolerance to chemicals and medi medications, more sensitivities to bright light, noises, foods, food sensitivity, more allergies, lower blood pressure, synesthesia, which means that your senses blend together so that you can see sounds or you can taste noises, you know, where, where the different senses are blending together. Some people after near-death experiences have more rapid healing and other people do not. I was an example of do not. Uh, many people can have unusual energy flows and migratory body pains after their near-death experience, swings in their energy level, changes in sleep patterns, so I have to ask this one. One of the very common changes in sleep patterns that people have after near-death experiences, kundalini awakenings, other spiritually transformative experiences, is middle of the what night awakening, where they wake up about three o'clock in the middle of the night unexplicably. So how many people here have a problem with middle of the night awakening? <laughs> Just so you can see, at least, at least two-thirds of the audience, if not more. Uh, yeah, so um, that's normal. If you're an experiencer, we just get used to it. Electromagnetic sensitivity, I want to mention this one too. And this works two ways. It's experiencers tend to notice that they, somehow their energy field becomes more sensitive to electromagnetic energy fields. So that it's like, it bothers you. You can feel it and other people can't feel it, but it bothers the experiencer that they're sensitive to electromagnetic fields. But then there's an opposite thing that happens, that the energy of the experiencer affects electromagnetic fields. So we'll, we'll make the microphone not work, we'll make the computer not work, we'll suddenly make light bulbs start popping. And so I've had a number of people in the audience going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For me, it manifests mainly with popping light bulbs, but every now and then I'm known to fritz out computers and microphones. So it's one of those things that experiencers have as after effects. Moving along here. There are a lot of psychological after effects. I'm going to move very rapidly because I want to make sure we have time for questions. Abandoning, self-destructive habits, growing up, you finally stop drinking, you finally stop doing drugs, you finally stop smoking, you heal your relationships with relatives, etc. Setting healthier boundaries is an after effect. 
reevaluating jobs and relationships and getting out of ones that really don't serve you. People have a renewed sense of life purpose, sometimes even of a mission. People can have new interests, become more creative. Um, often people find after a near-death experience that there may be journaling or writing poetry or composing songs or have an urge to dance, that there's this surge in creativity. And also repressed childhood memories can surface. And I look at that as part of the inner house cleaning process that starts. So it's, it's a good thing to, to heal our repressed memories. People will have all sorts of uh, psychic after effects, more intuitive, more psychic, more sentient, more premonitions, more synchronicities, mediumship ability, channeling, all these things, higher guidance happen after NDEs and FTEs. And spiritual after effects, people losing their fear of death, convinced of the afterlife, um, expansive concepts about love, about unconditional love, absolutely convinced of the reality of the higher power, not because their church told them to believe it, because they know it, they've experienced it, become more generous, less materialistic, uh, more spiritual, but maybe less religious. You know, don't seem to fit in the box of their particular religion anymore. There can be challenging after effects too. There can be difficulties in relationships because the person really has changed. You know, that a person who's had a white light near-death experience is changed afterwards. And so this can sometimes lead to conflicts uh, in marriages, in relationships, in families. There can be challenging confusion, anxiety, particularly you don't know what happened to you. You're maybe in, in a group of friends context where, where people don't believe you or are labeling, labeling it as crazy. So this can lead to a lot of uh, anxiety, confusion. There's a fear of being labeled as crazy. Um, some people fear losing control. Um, some people may also be very sad that they were sent back. You know, they may feel very sad, like, why did I have to come back? Why couldn't I stay in that wonderful place of love and bliss? It's so much nicer over there, you know, so that people can be upset about the fact that they had to come back because it was so much nicer on the other side. And again, some of the surfacing memories that spontaneously surface can sometimes be quite challenging. Now, I want to mention a little bit about children's near-death experiences, as Diane mentioned, because I think more and more people are beginning to realize they've had childhood NDEs that they never realized was a near-death experience. But now, like that's what happened to me, now that we're bringing more awareness out about near-death experiences. So children don't realize it's paranormal, that, that it was just their experience. And so often it's many years later and in their adulthood that they finally realize, oh, this was a near-death experience. So children who've had near-death experiences tend to be more psychically open afterwards, more intuitive. You know, maybe they talk to spirits, maybe they talk to their, their, um, you know, their imaginary friend, but they're actually hearing their imaginary friend and seeing their imaginary friend. Um, and in the near-death experiences of children, it's much more common that they had light beings in their experience and also encountering angels or pets. Now, after effects in children, some of them that you might notice. So some of you are wondering, gee, I wonder if I had a childhood NDE. Just see how many of these childhood NDE after effects you have. So children who've had a childhood NDE tend to have an intense curiosity about God and be very interested in God more than so than children who have not had an NDE. They, they tend, PMH Atwater has done some of this research, I understand she was here recently, they tend to be highly proficient in certain subjects, math, science, history, another one is music. They tend to have an enhanced vocabulary, uh, be unusually mature for their age, uh, also have enhancement of intellect, be very gifted in languages, be highly creative, uh, affectionate and home-loving. You know, and when I look back at myself as a child, now that I realize I was a childhood near end year, I realize, oh my goodness, I can check virtually every one of these boxes. And I never realized for most of my life that I was a childhood end year. 
Uh, uh, continuing on with children's after effects, a shift between being a fast talker and a fast thinker. And I remember my, my parents talking to my school teacher, what is it about her? Why does she talk so fast? And the teacher would say, well, it's because she's thinking so fast. She's just trying to get her words out. And so, hmm, effect of a childhood NDE. So, uh, yes. Also, being distressed by violence and, and violent news reports. Uh, a, an after effect, a symptom of children who've had NDEs, disliking games that are rough or physical, uh, sensitivities to lights and sounds, allergies, and children too can have a change in their sleep patterns. And they may see spirits, as I did as a, an 11 year old when I was seeing the ghosts in my house. Now there are also some issues I want to mention briefly about veterans who've had near-death experiences because many of our veterans are having near-death experiences and for them there are certain issues because they're concerned about if they share their stories, it's going to affect their security clearances, they're concerned what's going to happen if this gets on their official record. They're also concerned about how are they going to be able to deal with combat violence, with um, you know the increased sensitivities that they have after their near-death experience. There's also concerns that it's just going to be labeled as PTS, post-traumatic stress. I'm going to go very quickly so we'll have time for questions. Uh, there's a lot of research now. Near-death experiences are not post-traumatic stress. There's a whole bunch of reasons they're not the same. I'm just going to go quickly. Uh, NDEs are also not hallucinations. Dr. Bruce Grayson has tabulated a bunch of symptoms of near-death experiences that are absolutely not compatible with a psychotic hallucination. So I'm going to wrap here, and then we're going to uh, have time for questions. Is The bottom line I want to say to each and every one of you is how can we support near-death experiencers? What have we learned in our 40 years, my 40 years of, of clinical work, and IANS in its 40 years of trying to support NDE experiencers? And this is true for STE experiencers too, not just NDE experiencers. It's listen, listen, listen. Let people tell their stories and listen to their story. Second, validate it, believe it. This is their experience. Even though it may seem far out to you, believe it. They're telling you their truth. And then thirdly, help to educate them. You know, maybe give them a name. Like people said to me, gee, what, what would you call this experience I had? And they went blah, 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 blah. And I said, oh, I think you had a mystical vision. She goes, oh, that's what that is. That just like I had to search for years to find a name to call my experience, it's very helpful to find help people find a name for their experience. And in my book, Touched by the Light, that's up there if you're interested, I define this wide variety of, near, of spiritually transformative experiences. I give names that you could call it where it's not mental illness. And then finally, refer people for support. So one of the places you can refer people for support is to a support group like Chicago IANS or to IANS International if they're not in Chicago. We now have online support groups where people can meet other people who are experiencers and share their experiences online. There might be a local group in their area. And they might find support by reading some of the books, the books that were written by other experiencers. So that we would have time for questions, I'm going to end there. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today, and it's also going to be my joy. I'm going to do the best I can to serve you as the president of IANS International in the next year. Thank you. Uh, we'll have questions. I'll repeat your questions so people can hear. Why do we have to go through all this unenlightenment uh, life on Earth, whereas on the other side, you're progressing, you are illuminated, you're with God. Why do we have to go through this unilluminated suffering world? Okay, the question is, why do we have to go through the relatively unilluminated suffering world here when it's so wonderful on the other side? That's an interesting question. You'll have to ask the higher power when you get out there. <laughs> but, but my response to that is that um, what I've learned through my, my, my five near-death experiences is that where we actually do our learning and growth is on this plane. 
that it's sort of like a rest in between when we're on the other side, and then we get sent back here to continue our learning of growth. It's sort of like the various stages at school, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, over many incarnations. And it's just divine design. God's plan, he's having fun that way. Yes? Hypothetical in regards to your unity experience of communion, can one be uh, a soldier in war and maintain that state? Like carry, wood, carry water, chop wood, can one go to war in that unitary spirit? This is an interesting question. Can one go to war? Can one be a soldier, for example, a warrior, and also be in that spiritual unitive state of consciousness? So I would say this to that, that it would be very difficult, but yes. And that, that would be the ideal that as we grow and evolve as souls, that we would be able spiritually to maintain that spiritual unitive state of consciousness, no matter what the role that we are called to play in life. And if we are called to play the life, our role as a warrior, to defend our family, to defend our village, to defend our people, that, that we play our role. There's a, the, the Bible in the Hindu religion is called the Bhagavad Gita, and there's a very famous line in it which says, stand up and fight Arjuna. And so Arjuna was being taught to be a spiritual warrior. You know, that, that wherever divine has placed you, learn to be in that state of communion, playing your role wherever the divine has placed you. Yes, in the green shirt up there. Why is it better to die consciously than unconsciously? The question was, why is it better to die consciously than non-consciously? Uh, well, what I learned in my, in, in my spiritual studies is that if you die consciously, you know where you're going, just like me. So I was not fighting the current, like some people get stuck fighting the current. I didn't go out sideways into some lower astral plane. I had my eye on my destination and I was going for it. So that if you die consciously, you can uh, hopefully speed your process to as high a place on the other side as possible. Yes? Uh, those who have distressing experiences, Distressing near-death experiences, yes. yes. Um, what, I, I, I'm wondering if some of them are left with fears of dying after that, and, and what kind of work do you do with them to help them you know, to uh, reconcile? Okay, so the question was, do people who've had distressing near-death experiences sometimes have a fear of dying? And you were asking if I do some sort of work with people with distressing near-death experiences. First off, I'm retired. I'm no longer uh, practicing counseling experiencers, I'm sorry. Um, and sometimes people who have a distressing near-death experience, yes, they're very troubled by it afterwards. But it can also be a source of personal growth. You know, that they're, they're questioning why they had this experience, what is it that I can learn? So I'm thinking now of somebody I met last year who has had two near-death experiences. His first one was a very positive white light one, and his second one was a distressing one. And he's used his distressing one, uh, you know, perhaps because he, he has the, the spiritual maturity, having had a previous white light near-death experience, figuring that there must be something that I can learn from this negative or distressing near-death experience. So he's done a lot of soul searching and a lot of personal growth by reflecting on it. And um, if I were still practicing, I would probably take that sort of attack with somebody. Like, what can we learn from this experience? Like, what are the pluses that can come out of this challenging experience? Yes? I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Robert Monroe's book, Journeys Out of the Body, mm -hmm. and he supposedly has a clinic somewhere in the East Coast. The question is about out-of-body experiences and Monroe, yes. Mm -hmm. He takes people out of their body. Yes. How does that fit into this? Do they have near-death experiences when they do that? Okay, so the question is, when they go to the Monroe Institute and learn how to have out-of-body experiences, are those near-death experiences? No, they're not. They are out-of-body experiences. So people are learning how to have an out-of-body experience, and that's what it is, an out-of-body experience. Do they ever have a near-death experience that you've heard of while they're there? 
Um, no, I've not heard of it while they're there, no. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I, I get the impression that your opinion is that meditation is the, the best route to connect with spirit. Yes, my impression is meditation is the best route to connect with spirit. Prayer and meditation, daily practice twice a day, is my recommendation for everybody. So you would not consider hypnosis or mediums or anything of that nature? Uh, so what is it you want to ask me about hypnosis and mediums? Would you consider using those as an uh, approach to make a connection? Okay, would I... Rec uh, would I recommend them? I, I don't uh, recommend them. Um, I think if somebody wants to consult a psychic or medium, that's their choice. Um, will that help you personally as an individual um, grow and learn and move closer to God at a faster rate than if you were doing your own practice of prayer and meditation? I don't think so. I think that, that the, the rocket route, the fastest way to deepen and grow spiritually, that according to what I've learned um, and what I'm personally living in my personal life, is to do your inner work, to do your inner house cleaning, live a, a balanced lifestyle, and do a regular practice of prayer and meditation. Yeah. Yes? I, I've heard some spiritual teachers say that our problem is that we're not incarnated enough as spiritual beings. How do you see the relationship of the near-death experience becoming more fully, I'll call it spiritually incarnated, or soul-infused? Okay, so uh, basically he was asking about near-death experiences helping us to be more soul-infused, helping us in our spiritual growth. I think near-death experiences do give us sort of a, um, a, a jump forward on our spiritual path. So, you know, we're walking along the slow route, and then we have a near-death experience, and whoop, we find ourselves jumping forward a little bit. So maybe it's a little bit of a, a kickstart from the other side that's uh, uh, giving us a bunny hop a little bit further on our spiritual growth. So who knows? Maybe that's part of why it's becoming more and more common that spirit is trying to help us along the way. Are there some questions on this side? Yes, go ahead. You said when you were 11 years old, you were able to see spirits. I was just wondering, yes. were you able to see them fully, just by face, by the okay. The before? question was, when I was 11 years old, after my near-death experience, I was able to see spirits for a period of time. The question was, what did they look like? <laughs> All right. So what I personally saw uh, was they were uh, wispy, wraith-like figures, so that the face was more... Uh, distinctive, but the body was more sort of um, wispy and less distinctive. And they, I could see them at night most clearly, uh, and they just seemed to be in the space around me. Was there another question over here? Sorry, fellow in green, you asked already, so I'll get the lady up there. Yes? Okay. Um, when you're meditating, uh, what are some of the things you get out of it that are more tangible? like? When I was meditating once, I was thinking, well, I, I have type 2 diabetes, and I'm wondering what the heck is, is causing this and everything, And because uh, nobody in my family has it. And I have this meditation, and then all of a sudden, it's like I have this clear word, um, duodenum. And, and I thought, I've never heard of that word before. And could this really be a word? And I looked it up, and it really was a word in your, in your body, a, a part of your intestines. Yeah. So the question is, what, what are some of the more tangible things you can get out of your meditation? And, and she shared a story where she got an answer for a word that was relating to the question that was in her mind. And yes, you can absolutely get answers to questions in your meditation. Um, it's like when you meditate and you still your mind, you are making yourself receptive. And uh, Yogananda used to call it like the moon is reflecting on a pond. If there's a whole bunch of ripples, you don't get a clear reflection of the moon. But if the pond is still, you can get a crystal clear reflection of the moon. So if spirit's trying to tell you something, give you a message, and your mind's all ruffled because of you know, the world being as it is, um, 
that maybe you're not getting the message clearly, but when you still in your mind through meditation, then guidance or advice can come through quite uh, clearly, yes? Um, and then later, years later, I read about a, a doctor, a woman doctor in France who thinks it's the duodenum, uh -huh. and the um, certain chemical in the duodenum, I, what's that word? Um, and, and then now I've heard more about how they can operate on the duodenum and take part of it out and they'll get rid of <laughs> it might help your medical condition oh my goodness i mean so i, I know it must have been god said all right so follow in the green you can ask your second question now oh, oh, who pulled you out of the path of the train i don't remember he asked who pulled me out of the path of the train i don't know <laughs> i guess similarly how did the nurse get to the shore the nurse in the plane crash was not able to swim through the grace of God and the miracle, there was a, a one piece of ice there that had some wood in it. And so the wood that was frozen in the ice, she clung to that, and it was enough buoyancy to support her, but it was not enough buoyancy to support the other people. And so my pilot and I had to swim to shore. And she uh, clung to that until the helicopter came, and then the helicopter actually plucked her out of the water. Yes, over there. In a lot of um Panel discussions professionally on consciousness studies, especially now with the advent of artificial intelligence, there's a decidedly materialistic bet uh, that the brain is the uh, source of consciousness. And then there are people arguing that NDEs can be explained materialistically. People like Susan Blackmore, for instance, comes to mind. I put you more in a category like Evan Alexander, a medical professional who's had NDEs. Have you personally been on any kind of professional panels where this type of information can uh, contribute to the consciousness discussions so that another point of view for survival or a, a new kind of dualism perhaps uh, can inform those conversations? So the question, just to repeat the question, was about uh, that there are doctors that have a very materialistic view that they believe consciousness is a product of the brain firing. And so they don't believe that the consciousness can exist separate from the brain. And he was asking about, you know, forums where doctors can interact with people who hold that belief system. Um, I have a twofold response to that. I was talking, Dr. Bruce Grayson, one of the co-founders of IONS, we've been friends for over 30 years. And um, I was talking to him at the recent IONS conference, international conference in Philadelphia, uh, and someone had asked him this particular point while we were standing there. And his answer is, this is Bruce Grayson's answer, and I concur with him completely, is he says, it's come to a point in time that there is so much evidence that the near-death experience is real. There is so much evidence. We've got volumes of it, volumes of it, of people who have observed things while they were out of their body that has been confirmed when their body was physically dead. So there is absolutely no way that that perception was a product of the physical body. But what Bruce Grayson said is that there are some doctors researchers, and just society in general. There are some people that are absolutely locked in to their materialistic view, and it doesn't matter how much evidence you show them to the contrary, they are just convinced of their worldview. So Bruce has said, Yvonne, I've stopped trying to convince people. <laughs> you know, I, I now, I'm talking to people who are willing to listen and uh, who are willing to um, see the research, who are willing to understand. But there will always be opportunities. Have I personally talked to some of these people? Yes. And it ends up being, I present my particular viewpoint. They say, eh, I disagree. It's all caused by the brain. And then basically the people listening in the audience will have to make their own conclusions. I want to get the fellow behind you who also has a question. Um, I'm, I'm always been curious about the people that to see Jesus, uh -huh. or uh, it seems like a lot of them do. Um, 
So that whole idea of they're seeing or they're projecting to this higher power is life. Are you talking about people who saw Jesus in their near-death experience? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is relating to people who see Jesus or people who might say see Buddha that is compatible with their particular spiritual tradition and the question is what was people who don't have a spiritual tradition see. So uh, I want to answer that and say that it's very varied, okay? That um, when I, uh, leaves me as an example. When I had my 1979 near-death experience and I went into the white light realm, that experience was very different from what I had been taught God to be. So it totally changed my perception of the higher power because it was not compatible with what I had been taught it was to be. Now, interestingly, I spoke at IANS in 1993 in St. Louis, and that's in the Bible Belt down there. And I had this fellow come up to me saying, oh, hallelujah, you saw Jesus in your near-death experience. And I went, hmm, I, I don't think I said that. He said, well, of course you did. You said you saw the light. And if you saw the light, you saw Jesus, because Jesus is the light. And, and so, you know, in, in his particular interpretation, that is how he understood it. Um, and so I, I allow people to have their particular interpretation. That was not how I experienced it. So sometimes that might happen, that somebody based on their particular religious ideology might interpret, oh, I saw the light and therefore it was Jesus. Now there are other people, like let's take my 1995 uh, near-death experience. I saw a religious figure that did not fit into my tradition. Right? I was raised a Christian. I had never seen, I didn't know who that was. Um, and so that's happened to some people that they'll see religious figures from another spiritual tradition, not their own. Then there is a group that do see a religious figure from their tradition. Now, my 2003 near death experience, I'm following a type of Christian yoga, practicing Kriya Yoga. And Yogananda and Babaji are two of the, the saints of that particular tradition. And I did see saints from my, my particular spiritual path. And so that will also sometimes happen. And there are many cases, including children, who said that they saw a physical figure of Jesus as a white light being on the other side. And I absolutely believe that that can occur as well. So basically what I'm saying is it's very varied. Okay, sometimes it's a figure from your own spiritual tradition, sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's how people interpret it, like how do we interpret the light. Now I see Diane inching down. Do we have time for one more question? All right, woman right here. Um, the cardiologist who did the study in 12% of the people. Yeah, Pim Von Lummel, the cardiologist who did the study on, in, on uh, cardiac arrest patients. 12% had MDD. 12% had NDEs, yes. So 88% did not? That is correct. 88% did not. So I would imagine if I wasn't at 88%, I would feel kind of like the person who was sent back when they wanted to stay. Like, what, what about me? What happened? Why not me? So yeah. do they do studies about the 88%? We really don't know why some people have near-death experiences and why they don't. Um, and I found something in the yogic literature that helped me come to something that I can live with, which is what happens to people after they die? Like, does everybody go up into the light? Um, or do some people not? Like, why do some people have near-death experiences and others do not if they were clinically dead for that length of time? Why don't they remember anything? So in yoga, it's understood that not everybody um, between incarnations, because reincarnation is, is understood in many, many world traditions, 
and that um, many people go into what's called the great sleep between incarnations. It's like a really deep, peaceful sleep, and you really, really get to rest. <laughs> Or it could be that they, another, uh, I read that they may go into the white light astral just for a little bit, for a little blessing, like a kiss from mama before we go into the great sleep. And then, you know, they don't really remember much of the astral when they incarnate in their next body because the time there was so brief. So that's sort of how I've now come to understand the percentage of people who don't have near-death experiences, maybe by whatever their karma or the divine design, they're some of the ones that get to go into the, the great sleep. I'd like to add just a short little PS to your last question. Um, one of the things I learned on the other side was that there is no one way to do anything. I think there are as many answers to that question as there are souls in the universe. Yeah. I think we come here to learn lessons and we're all on a path and we're all guided and we're all taken to our best possibilities by the, the great powers that are helping us on, on every day. So I think there's no one way to do anything. If anybody tells you differently, I'd be really suspicious of them.